D-Lo, ay, yeah, clutch. I'm in the clutch, we in the clutch, it's even been clutch. You think that we suck, your dreams are the luck, your ship is just sunk, we turn off a way. Ooh, yeah, see that my face is up in disgust because people talking a mess, but there's nothing to discuss. I'm just being honest, I'm keeping it a bug. Uh huh. We in the clutch! What's going on, Clutch Squat? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy Dub. It's your boy Ross. And we're in the clutch. Hey. hey. Back to the general of the picture today. You feel me? Top three unsolvable mysteries. Unsolvable mysteries part. One. Yeah, we're gonna do uh check out this little series here, mm -hmm. man. You guys have been loving our reactions to Mr. Ballin himself, man. He yes, has sir. easily some of the best bingeable uh content on YouTube. So nah, for if real. you haven't already, go subscribe to him, check him out. Yes. You're gonna be hooked <laughs> at you the are. stories that he he tells and narrates. So. We just don't have no damn popcorn. Yeah, that's the only thing we miss, man. Reclining back, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this get in. This they get good. Nah, but we're about to take this one out. Make sure you run up the like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let's go. Today, we're going to look at three unsolved mysteries that each have lots of evidence, but no one can make sense of them. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel be yep, because that's all man. we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to make the like button a nice hot cup content. of coffee when they nah, wake up real. and then proceed to yeah, make them an extremely day. weak yep. and lukewarm cup of coffee with too much milk and too much splendor. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads mm -hmm. all right let's get into today's stories Mr. Ballin. Ballin in the mix with these stories man little creepy little problem <laughs> John Doe Doe John in 1993, David Lewis was an accomplished lawyer living in Amarillo, Texas with his wife, Karen, and his nine-year-old daughter. He was known to be a devoted husband and father who spent much of his off time supporting various charitable causes. Mm. On January 28th of that year, Karen and their daughter decided to leave Amarillo and go to Dallas to spend the weekend shopping together. Yeah, David, who would normally go with them, decided to stay home because he did not want to miss the Super Bowl, which was that Sunday, the 31st. So Karen and their daughter left, and then a couple of days later on the 31st, they returned to Amarillo and they actually got back to their house right after the Super Bowl had ended. And so they anticipated going into the house and finding David either cleaning up after himself or maybe watching the post game. But when they walked in, the TV was still on and turned to the channel the Super Bowl had been on, but David was nowhere to be found. Karen noticed that the VCR was actually still recording. Mm -hmm. David was known to record all major sports games and mm -hmm. watch them again. Yeah, and so clearly he had not turned off the recording. As Karen walked around the house yelling for her husband, she wasn't that concerned. She figured he must have stepped out or something, but she went into the kitchen and she opened up the fridge and she found there was a plate with two freshly made turkey sandwiches on it, which was a sandwich David would often make. And she thought that was pretty weird that he would have made them and then let them sit inside the fridge. Yeah. So she closed the fridge and turned around and on the counter in the kitchen was his wedding band and his watch. And so oh. even though there were all these kind of strange things that Karen was finding in the house, she really wasn't that concerned. There was no sign of forced entry. Yeah. There was no sign the house had been burglarized. There was no sign of a struggle. And so she assumed her husband must have stepped out to watch the second half of the game at a friend's house and that he would be back later. And so Karen stayed up for a little while, but then ultimately she went to bed thinking he would be there in the morning. But the next morning when she got up, there was no sign of her husband. And so she went to the police. Within 24 hours, the police located David's abandoned car downtown near the courthouse. Under one of the car's mm. floor mats, they located his car keys as well as his house keys. And then within the car, they found his checkbook, his credit cards, and his driver's license all in the places they should be. They looked into his bank activity and they saw there was a recent deposit for $5,000 into his family's account. They also saw that he recently purchased two plane tickets. One was from Los Angeles to Dallas and the other was from Dallas to Amarillo, but it wasn't clear if he had used either of these tickets. When Karen was told about the found car and the strange bank activity, she told police that her husband had recently told her that he actually thought he might be in danger because he was scheduled to give a deposition in Dallas later that month in a conflict of interest case between his old law firm and a wealthy mm. client. And David mm. was being pressured to cover up some of the wrongdoings of his previous law firm, and he just uh, wasn't right, right. willing to do that. He told his family that he was gonna tell the truth no matter who it hurt. David understood that put a huge target on his back. Yeah. While police were certainly intrigued at this new information, they didn't have any evidence to support the idea that someone was actively trying to silence David. It was just a conspiracy. And so for 11 months, Months, they looked for new leads and new information, but nothing came out and David never popped up. He never called home. There was no sign of him. Damn. So after 11 months, the police decided that David must have left of his own accord and that there was no foul play here. And so they closed the case. And after that, David's family 
Detroit, unfortunately, just had to accept the fact that he was gone and yeah. that more than likely no one was ever going to find him again. But in 2004, a state trooper in Washington state was on the internet just researching unsolved mysteries and he came across a picture of David Lewis. And immediately he recognized that he looked exactly like an unidentified victim of a hit and run case he covered back in 1993. And so he pulled up the details of this hit and run and he found the victim had been struck a day after David Lewis had gone missing. When this John Doe got hit, he was dressed head to toe in military clothing. He had no bags, he had no ID, and he was walking aimlessly down Highway 24 in Washington State. So 1,600 miles away from Amarillo, Texas, where David Lewis had gone missing. But despite the enormous distance between these two events, this trooper was convinced David Lewis was this John Doe. But as he's looking at the picture of David Lewis, he realizes he has glasses and he didn't think the John Doe was wearing glasses. But just to be sure, he checked the belongings list of the John Doe and it said he did have glasses. Mm. And it was the exact same kind that David was wearing in the picture. And eventually DNA would confirm that David Lewis was the John Doe. Wow. Now this solved the mystery of where David Lewis went but it did not solve the mystery of why he went there. Yeah. Why did David go to Washington, a place where he has no ties? And if David was the one who hit record on his VCR on the night of the Super Bowl, that means he would have only had less than 24 hours to move 1,600 miles yeah. to Washington yeah. State without his car. And why was he wearing military clothing? Was that his clothing? Did he buy it? Did yeah, someone make a lot him wear of, it? Uh, Where was his luggage? What was he there. doing walking down so the highway? Many. David's assertions to his wife that his life was in danger, his demeanor as a loving family man, and the nature of his job as an attorney has many people, his family included, believing that he was the victim of foul play. But officially, the police have said David left the house of his own accord and his death was ruled an accident. Damn, that's, that's crazy. Super crazy. Sheesh. In 2000, Mary Lou Morris was a 48-year-old loan officer at a Chase Bank in Houston, Texas. Oh, On the morning man. of October 12th, Mary Lou oh, said goodbye to her husband, Jay, and she had... Oh, man. It got real this close. This is a little too close to home got, for me, little, man. Got a little close, man. Hey, man. First, first time, right? <laughs> I think this is the first time Damn, we've actually heard man. about somebody being from the city. And I bank with Chase, too. Oh, yeah. man. I do, too, man. God nah, damn it. All right, let's see what's going on here. It's my side account, though. That's just a little bit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, ain't the main one. In Houston, Texas. On the yeah. morning of October 12th, Mary Lou said goodbye to her husband, Jay, and she headed off to work. That afternoon, Jay gave his wife a phone call, but she didn't pick up. He left her a message, and she never got back to him. This was very unlike Mary Lou, and so Jay was a little bit concerned. At 5 p.m., when he still hadn't heard from her, Jay called her back, but again, she didn't pick up. So Jay called Mary Lou's supervisor, who informed Jay that Mary Lou had actually not come to work that day, and they couldn't get in touch with her either. Jay immediately knew something was wrong, and he uh, called the right. police. The police had not even begun searching for her when a call came into the station from an ATV rider that happened to be on a road about three miles away from Mary Lou's house. And he said he spotted a smoldering car, and it looks like there's someone in the driver's seat that's obviously deceased. Earlier that day, at about 10 a.m., the fire department had gotten a call about smoke in that area, but they assumed it was a controlled burn, so they didn't investigate. When the police arrived on scene, it was impossible to tell who the person was that was sitting in the driver's seat, but they were able to find a tooth fragment, and they used mm. that to confirm that it was, in fact, Mary Lou Morris. Damn. It was quickly determined that this was most likely a homicide, and her attacker had probably set this up to make it appear like it could have been self-inflicted. Gasoline had been poured all over Mary Lou wow. and all over the vehicle. However, because of how badly damaged the car and she was, they couldn't determine a cause yeah. of death. So they weren't sure if she was deceased when she was placed in the car and it was lit on fire or if she was in the car and the fire was the cause of death. A number of Mary Lou's valuables were still inside of the car, but her wedding ring was not on her finger. Mary Lou's family and the community at large were shocked. They just could not understand why anybody would want to target such a nice person that had yeah. no enemies. The day after Mary Lou's death, a local Houston newspaper received an anonymous call from a guy who just said, Mary Lou's death was an accident. And the newspaper tried to get more information, but the person hung up and they couldn't trace the call. At the same time this drama was unfolding for Mary Lou Morris, another drama was unfolding for another Houston woman with the same name. 39-year-old Mary McGinnis Morris was a successful nurse practitioner who by and large got along with all of her coworkers with one exception. A new employee at the clinic, a male nurse named Dwayne Young, was making her feel really uncomfortable. One day when Mary McGinnis got back to her desk, she found all of her pictures of her family had 
been flipped onto their faces and in the middle of her desk was a piece of paper that just said death to her. And she knew right away this had to be Dwayne, but she had no way to prove it. And so that night when she went home, she told her husband, Mike, about this guy, Dwayne. And she said, I don't feel safe at work. Can you teach me how to shoot a gun? And so he did. He taught her how to shoot a gun. And then he went out and got a pistol and she tucked it under her driver's seat in her car just in case. On October 16th, so four days after Mary Lou Morris was found dead and three days after that anonymous phone call to the newspaper, Mary McGinnis Morris was at a drugstore after work. And as soon as she went inside, she noticed there was this strange man on the other side of the store that was just watching her. She called yeah. her best friend Lori to tell her that there was this strange guy and wanted to know what to do. And Lori said, you know, wait for him to leave. But the guy didn't leave. He just stayed in the store and stared at Mary. And so eventually Mary said, you know what? I'm just gonna pay for my stuff and get out of here. I gotta stop by the office, but I'll be home in just a few minutes. I'll be totally fine. And so Mary hangs up, she buys what she needs. She leaves the store. And then 12 minutes later, she places a frantic 911 call saying someone's trying to kill her. And this 911 call was not made public because apparently on the tape, you can actually hear her being attacked. Mary oh. McGinnis was found later that night in her car. Oh. She was deceased. She had a single gunshot wound to the head. It was clear from her 911 call that she had been attacked, and so this was almost certainly a homicide. However, her attacker tried to stage it so it looked like it was self-inflicted. The murder weapon, which was actually her pistol that was tucked underneath her seat, had been placed next to her hand on the seat next to her. None of Mary McGinnis's valuables were stolen. However, her wedding ring was missing from her finger. After Mary McGinnis Morris's death, people began to speculate that her death and Mary Lou Morris's death were connected. Specifically, this was a professional hit gone wrong. The reasoning yeah. for this theory is there was just too many coincidences. They shared the same name, they lived in the same city, they were killed within days of each other, and both of their deaths were staged to look like they were self-inflicted. Uh -huh. And each woman was missing their wedding ring, which apparently is a common way for professional hitmen to let their clients know that the job was done. The yeah. people that subscribe to this theory believe Mary McGinnis Morris was the intended target yeah. and Mary Lou Morris was just uh -huh. an accident. And in fact, after killing Mary Lou Morris, the hitman must have realized, whoops, I made a mistake. Uh -huh. And they called the newspaper to say, literally, that was a mistake. Jake. And then a couple of days later, the hit was successfully carried out on Mary McGinnis Morris. Oh. The police looked into this theory and they discovered that Mary McGinnis's husband, Mike, had recently accused her of cheating on him and he was really, really upset about it. He also refused to take a polygraph test and would not allow his daughter to talk to the police. And Mary McGinnis had a $700,000 life insurance policy that Mike was in line to receive. And so immediately everybody's like, okay, obviously Mike put yeah. a hit out on his wife and that's what started this whole thing. But when they dug into it, they realized that no matter how upset Mike was, there wasn't any evidence that tied him to the killing of his wife or to Mary Lou Morris, and so he was ruled out as a suspect. Yeah. As for Mary McGinnis's co-worker, Dwayne Young, who wrote Death to Her on her desk, it was clear that he did not like Mary, but he was ruled out as a suspect as well. And unfortunately, that's where both of these cases go Damn. cold. To date, Damn. no one's ever been charged in either murder. Damn, bro. Jeez. In 1996, Blair Adams was 31 yeah, years old and living in Surrey, British Columbia. Although in the past he had struggled with substance abuse and alcoholism, over the previous two years he had really gotten his act together and got a great job as a foreman at a local construction company. He was known to be a cheerful and friendly guy that did not have any known enemies. But that summer, Blair started exhibiting uncharacteristic mood swings that his mother would describe as being frequent and wild. In a matter of weeks, Blair transformed from being very calm and relaxed and friendly to being totally panicked all the time and always looking over his shoulder and he was so stressed out he couldn't sleep at night. And he began telling his co-workers that he was fairly certain someone was trying to kill him. And they would say to him, Blair, I don't think you're okay. You really need to see a doctor. When his mother confronted him about his erratic, paranoid behavior, he told her, Mom, I really shouldn't tell you about it. And she said, what's it? And he said, Mom, I can't say anything else. And that was it. She could never get any more information out of her son. Blair's strange behavior came to a head on Friday, July 5th, when he went to his bank and withdrew all of the cash out of his account, totaling $6,000. And he also emptied his safety deposit box, which contained thousands of dollars worth of jewelry and gold. Two days later on Sunday, he left his house and drove 30 minutes to the Canada-USA border, and he attempted to enter the United States. But being a single guy carrying a bunch of cash and jewelry and acting really nervous, 
He fit the profile of a drug trafficker, and yeah. so he was denied entry. Frustrated, Blair left and went back to his house, and the next day, which was Monday, he went to his construction site, and he abruptly told his boss that he was quitting. And he didn't even pick up his final paycheck. He just left. After leaving the construction yeah, site, he went so straight yeah. to the airport, where he promptly purchased a $1,600 round trip to Frankfurt, Germany. Although we don't know why he wanted to go to Frankfurt, Germany, he did work there briefly the year before. His flight was supposed to leave the following day, which was Tuesday, but immediately after purchasing this plane ticket, Blair suddenly decided that he needed to try again to cross into the USA. So he rushed to a friend's house, he knocked on her door, she opens it up and he looks totally disheveled and he's telling her that someone's trying to kill me, I need your help getting across the border, I just got rejected a couple of days ago, can you please drive me across, I've got kids, it'll look much more convincing, can you do that for me? And she was really spooked by his behavior and felt like this is not something I want to get involved with, right. so she said, sorry, I can't help you. So Blair headed home where he hid out for the day and then the next day, Tuesday, he went to the airport but instead of getting on his flight to frankfurt germany he went to the front desk and requested a refund and it was granted he told them that the person he was going to meet in germany had gotten sick and so now he couldn't go and so the only person he could have been talking about was the girl he had briefly had a fling with when he was there for work the year earlier but later on, investigators would talk to that German girl and she would say she was not in touch with Blair and she definitely was not expecting him. Blair left the airport and rented a car, which was a Nissan Altima, and he immediately went to the US-Canada border, except this time he was able to get across. Mm. He made his way to Seattle, Washington, where he went over to their airport and then abandoned his Nissan in the middle of a parking lot and then went down and bought a one-way ticket to Washington, DC. Now he paid $770 for this one-way ticket, Damn. but he could have just purchased a round trip for half the the price yeah. but either way he boarded the plane that night and by wednesday morning he was in washington dc he got off the plane and rented another car which was a toyota camry and then drove 500 miles southwest to knoxville tennessee blair was oh. not seen in knoxville until about 5 30 p.m that evening when he showed up at a gas station complaining of car troubles and so the gas station attendant came out to try to help Blair, and he immediately diagnosed what the problem was. Blair was trying to start his Toyota Camry with the key to his Nissan Altima that he had abandoned in Seattle, Washington. Wow. And so the attendant pointed out that it was the wrong key, and Blair held it up and said, no, this is the one I was using. And the guy's like, no, it clearly says Nissan on it. And so Blair and this gas station attendant look around the car inside and out for this missing Toyota key. Blair's reaching in his pockets, he can't find it. Blair ends up calling the rental company, but they wind up being closed. And so the gas station attendant says, you know, unfortunately, we're gonna have to tow your car, but I'll give you a ride to a nearby hotel. And so Blair accepted the ride, and just after 6 p.m. that night, Blair walked through the front door of the Fairfield Inn, and then promptly turned around and walked out, yeah. and then walked in, and then walked out, over and over again, five separate times over the course of an hour, before he finally walked up to the front desk and asked for a room. The front desk attendant at the hotel said Blair was totally paranoid, constantly looking over his shoulder and just totally on edge the entire time. Oh. And then after she gave him his room and he paid for it, he took the key and instead of going up to his room, he just walked out again and then never came back. The following morning, two workers arrived at their construction site right across the street from the Fairfield Inn, and they discovered a body, and it would turn out to be Blair's. What? He was missing his socks, shoes, and pants, and he had scratches on his hands as well as on his face, but none of the abrasions were that significant. There was $4,000 in German, U.S., and Canadian currencies lying on the ground around him. Also spread out around Blair was his fanny pack full of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry and gold, a black duffel bag that contained maps and receipts, and then also that missing missing Toyota car key that they could not find the night before. That was lying on the ground as well. Blair's autopsy showed that he had died from a single violent blow to his stomach but they had no idea what actually struck his stomach. Damn. Toxicology reports showed that Blair had no drugs or alcohol in his system. The only DNA evidence that was found at the crime scene was a single long strand of hair that Blair was clutching in his fist. But there's no more information about this hair online. There were no witnesses, but there was a security guard who claimed to have heard screaming, a woman's scream coming from the area where Blair was discovered at about 3.30 in the morning. The only lead police had was the sketch of this guy that apparently people had seen Blair talking to out outside of a Cracker Barrel restaurant right after Blair had left the hotel. But police were never able to identify this man. Investigators were baffled. Was Blair telling the truth that yeah. someone had been trying to kill him Damn. for weeks leading up to his death and they finally caught up to him? And if so, why didn't he tell authorities? Or was Blair delusional and he just happened to run into another killer when he was in Tennessee? Unfortunately, we still have absolutely no idea. Sheesh. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you God, found the secret of today's episode- 
that is insane. All them stories in the membrane were uh, <laughs> definitely wild, man. And yeah, no, for yeah, sure. man. This is this is this is one of those type of things where it's like there's no real no real answer to solve these things. Yeah. Like so many things that it could be, and yeah, there's just no way to pinpoint it without mm-hmm. the actual facts. Yeah, yeah man. So. Like if he would have maybe told his mother what it what it was, yeah, yeah, that yeah. could be something that could have went off of. But yeah, but he never, he told, never told her. her. So. I don't know. They never know. You know what I'm saying? But hey, if y'all hey. want us to check out part two, y'all know what to do. What is? Run up. What? Run up the likes, man. We'll definitely check out part two of this series he has, man. This is oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely entertaining and informative. So. Yeah, man. One of the dopest um, commentators. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. what do you call it? Uh, <laughs> Content creators? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> storytellers yeah, yeah storytellers yeah 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 yeah. My, you can tell my brain but no uh, no nah, one of the dopest storytellers that yeah, for sure. we didn't came across so mm-hmm. hope you keep doing this thing running it up as usual man mm-hmm. but y'all keep on supporting us as well run up the likes and all that good stuff catch y'all next time in the next video peace out already if you got a problem then we got the solutions and there's no illusion i made this shit happen i'm living life lucid i'm switching my strategies now they hate on me cause I'm causing casualties But why are they after me? Deep inside they know they can't handle half of me